BibleChristian.org. Hello, this is Gary Pinnell, and we'd like to study with you Luke chapter 22. As Jesus is getting near to the end of his earthly life, the thing that he has come to do is to die for our sins above everything else, all the other things that he did. His greatest mission is to die for us. And he's going to, this is going to be reviewed here in chapter 22. So let's look at it. Now, it says, the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. So they didn't want to do it during the feast, but how do you like this? This is plotting a murder. I mean, how horrible, the religious leaders. And uh, Judy, Lord bless you, sister. Yes, good morning to you. Verse three, then Satan entered Judas. Now, uh, even as Satan will enter the Antichrist, someone who will yield themselves, a person who will yield themselves. Th this is what Satan did in entering Judas to do his uh, horrendous deed of killing, getting Jesus killed. Now, Jesus was in charge of everything, and it was not a tragedy. It was an accomplishment, but you see the human side of what went on that God allowed, and then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot who was numbered among the 12. What a horrible, horrible ending to a life. But Jesus chose him knowing exactly what he would do. And why he needed to do that was so that he could die for us and take away our sins. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priest, his big man, on the uh, totem pole here, as we say, and captains, how he might betray him to them. And all the time, the, the religious leaders are laughing behind his back as he takes out a dagger to stab Jesus in the back. And like when they were stabbing uh, Julius Caesar, and it says, uh, et tu brute, in other words, uh, you too, Brutus, you know, someone who was supposedly a friend, and this is Judas, uh, one of the apostles, and they were glad. So they're snickering behind his back and agreed to give him money. So I'm sure they're very serious about when they're doing this. Okay, well, this is a job, deserves some money here. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. So Judas' job was to find a time that he could make this more secret and it wouldn't be out in the open, but as just the opposite, opposite took place, wasn't it? Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. So Luke goes right to the heart of the matter. And the when the sacrifices are being killed, well, that's when Jesus is going to be killed on the same day. And he sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. Now, they normally uh, the Passover would have been eaten most of the time during the day, or at least before the day was over. Um, but here, 
Jesus is taking the Passover on the day that he is going to be crucified. He's taking it with his disciples, but he's taking it in the the beginning of the Passover time, which would be, this is Wednesday. Now, some people talk about Good Friday. I'm sorry it did not happen on Friday. Jesus was crucified on Wednesday to fulfill how that he was in the grave for three days and three nights as, as uh, because Jesus gave this sign as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the grave fish um, had the, the belly of the great fish there go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat so they said to him where do you want us to prepare it to prepare and he said to them behold when you have entered the city a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water which that would be unusual. Um, usually the women were carrying the pitcher of water, so they wouldn't have any trouble picking him out. A pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. And then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And this is a person whom it's possibility John Mark's uh, parents. Uh, it's a large upper room. And uh, so, verse 12, then he, he will show you a large furnished upper room. There, make ready. So they went and found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. So Judas is still with him at this time, with them. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So again, he's bringing out his suffering and uh, they so often, uh, Jesus has told them before, but they seems they just forget that and uh, don't want to think about it because uh, as far as they were concerned, Jesus was going to set up his earthly kingdom right away. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Now, Luke goes right into the Lord's Supper that's instituted at this time. Uh, would have been right after the Passover meal. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying... This is my body. Hello, Esther. Lord bless you, sister, there in India. Yes, this is my body, which is given for you to do this in remembrance of me. So the communion that we take, um, the bread that is broken, that uh, was together, that has two significances. It has a significance that Jesus' body would be broken, but also we are one body and we are one bread and we um, are represented by the bread. And likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, so he took... Um, a cup that they would have grape juice in. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. It's a fitting picture of Jesus' blood and the grape juices. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. 
So now Jesus is going to re reveal to the other apostles about Judas and what he's doing. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But, woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. It is in the uh, Psalms as to what uh, Judas would do and what would happen to his family. His wife would become a widow when uh, he committed suicide. Uh, the children would be orphans. The scripture prophesies that. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. Now they couldn't believe it. I mean, the other apostles just, wait, wait, wait. Who would do such a thing? We're all brothers, you know, this is the way they thought of it. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. So they're all uh, just joking, it seems, almost around and thinking about, well, I'm going to be uh, chief of staff. I'm going to be this, that, and the other thing. He said to them, the king of the Gentiles, the kings of the Gentiles, exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. Well, um, but not so among you. So they weren't supposed to be that way. They were supposed to be humble, not seeking their own good. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who served. Remember before this, uh, from the other uh, Gospels, we see that Jesus and John washed their feet. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. There would be a time that this will take place in the future. And sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel during the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that you may, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Oh, Pastor Emmanuel eh, there in India, thanks for watching. And Jesus is talking to Simon Peter. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Huh. It seems like they, he said this more than once. And then uh, Peter had. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. And he said to them, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said, Nothing. Then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished 
in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors, like a, he would be numbered with the sinners. Okay, because he's going, he has become one with us. He's going to take the sin of all the world upon himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. For the things concerning me have an end. Okay, there's a purpose, guys, and everything that I'm doing, it's for a reason. You won't really, you won't understand it now. They wouldn't understand it until after the death and resurrection, after the Jesus rose from the dead. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. So they were carrying those two swords with them. And Jesus is telling that as a symbol, not that he's going to physically fight at this time. And he says it again later when uh, Peter used a sword to cut off the high priest's ear, which he meant probably to whack him in the head. But um, uh, so they had the two swords there. And he went to the Mount of Olives. And he was accustomed, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now, Jesus had gone every day of his ministry knowing that he was going to the cross, what it would be like. Can you imagine? Yeah, he would uh, have to draw his thoughts away from that at times or else he couldn't even minister. But now it's come to that date, the date that he's going to die on the cross. And so he's with the apostles. They've gone up to the Mount of Olives to pray, the Garden of Gethsemane. I mean, and there he was praying with them. And his heart is just broken, thinking about not about himself, though, thinking about others. He was thinking about you and I. That's what he kept in view, that he would be able to take away our sins because God is a holy and just God. He cannot allow one thought, one word, one deed to go unpunished in the, his universe uh, or else he would stop being God. That's just how serious it is. And so Jesus knew that he would have to do that. Now, uh, physically, do you think, oh, you know, I'm going to get to go through all kinds of suffering. And no, he wasn't thinking that way. He's human like you and I. Okay. But he determined in his heart that he was going to go through with it. And no matter all that would happen, he already knew. But now he's yielding himself as he always did, into the Father's hands. And he did that through prayer. Okay. And so he's continuing. And uh, Dr. Luke, Physician Luke, gives the great details about uh, what is going to take place and what Jesus went through in the garden there. For the things concerning me have an end. There's a purpose for this. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. The swords, he was just giving it as a symbol that it was going to be a really rough night and they were going to be attacked and so on. Uh, but coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives. As he was accustomed, they spent... 
a lot of time praying there, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. All right. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He knew there was no other way to take away our sins. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. You could imagine the angel just in that tremendous moment that right before Jesus would go to the cross and God chose some angel that had been uh, just so loving and so wonderful and the one that God wanted to help comfort Jesus. And being in agony, Jesus is sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. Okay, he prayed more earnestly. Then he sweat. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, um, it is possible that doctors have said that people in horrendous situations of torture and so on, that they can even sweat. Blood comes through their sweat glands. And uh, Jesus was going through horrible, horrible suffering even before he, he went to the cross. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, shoo, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. I'm going to pretend Judas is as if nothing has happened, that this is just normal, because he wants to take Jesus and get his money. Uh, but Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? I'm sure he said it nice and loud. When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them, that's Peter, he didn't wait for an answer from the Lord, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Not a very good shot there, Peter. No, it's probably a good thing that he wasn't. But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And so he touched his ear and healed it. Isn't it interesting that uh, Luke, the physician, points this out. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Having arrested him, they led him and, uh, and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. Hmm. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. Okay. So now Peter that thought that he could go without, you know, uh, <sighs> failing Jesus, but he did fail Jesus. And um, 
the woman, I do not know him, he says to her. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. But Peter said, Men, I am not. Oh, boy. How horrible. Jesus is sitting right there listening to all of this. Then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now the men who had held Jesus mocked him and beat him. And having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemily uh, spoke against him. As soon as it was day, getting light now. Remember, this is all Wednesday from uh, 6 o'clock in the evening to now it's becoming light in the day. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes and all these things that they did, they did illegally and having a trial at night and, and so on striking Jesus before he's been uh, convicted, on and on it goes, um, came together and led him into the council, saying, now they've got uh, 68 of them there. Nicodemus is not there, which he was on the council. Joseph of Arimathea was not there. They were not going to have any part in this uh, kangaroo court that they were having against Jesus and it's very clear that they did not take part in that because they had become believers in Jesus as the Messiah. Verse 67 If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Amen. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need for we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. Okay. So it's hard for us, isn't it, to think about this scene that's going on. But at the same token, we know that he had to go through that for us. He did it because he loves us and he took our place on the cross. And as we meditate on that, let's just go to prayer and think about all that Jesus has done for us. And of all the things to me, uh, the Lord brings it to my remembrance, lots. And I'm glad that he does. But also that is why we have the communion, to remind us this is what Jesus did. It's not to sacrifice him again. When he's on the cross, he says, it is finished to tell us die. And it meant that it was paid in full, the debt that we had. And our debt has been paid in full. We can love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and he loves us and we'll spend eternity together with him. Father, thank you for your word. I pray now that you'll continue to speak to hearts as it goes forth. Accomplish your perfect will as you said your word will not return to you void 
but would fulfill that for which you sent it, will accomplish that for which you sent it, and it is not in vain. Your death was not in vain. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you so much for doing this for us. We just pray now that you'll help us to live every day of our life for you till the time comes for you, for us to be called home to be with you. We thank you. We will be faithful to you, the one who was faithful to us. Father, we do pray for Jerusalem and their hour of trial. And Lord, that they will speak to each and every person in this world to realize that we're on the verge of the precipice, as it were, the of even Third World War. And Lord, that you will help people to see the seriousness of this and that you will protect Israel. We pray too for those suffering for you around the world that you will bless them mightily, even this day. We pray all these things, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you, brothers and sisters in Christ, and thank you for being very faithful. I appreciate prayers. I speak at church this morning on Gideon's, and yesterday we were able to give out probably 600 New Testament, so we've given out over a thousand at the fair here. Appreciate continued prayer for that, as we'll give out many thousands of New Testaments here to the people in the Shakama Valley and surrounding areas. Thank you for your prayers for that. Many souls will be saved as they read the Word of God. All right, we'll see you, God willing, tomorrow. Shalom.